all species of animals have to have some way to manage the limited resources. So the first thing to remember is that dominance is only going to happen when there are limited resources. So in domestic dogs and our pets, there are very rarely any limited resources. They have plenty of food, they have plenty of attention, they have plenty of, of the resources that they need. So there's no need for any dominance. So we don't see dominance. There are a few breeds of dogs which still have very strong sense of social structure, limited resources, dominance, and so on. And in very rare occasions, some members of those breeds may actually get into a dominant situation over limited, what they perceive as limited resources with uh, humans. Um, and in fact, most likely it's gonna be with members of their social pack. Um, and so it's where I tend to see it in my clinical cases is most likely with owners. But this behavior is very rare, very, very, very unusual. So I can't say it doesn't happen um, that, that dogs try to dominate a, a, a human, an owner, particularly an owner, but it certainly is a very rare kind of behavior. There is one group of breeds that have been described by the geneticists as what's called the ancient breeds. And um, those members, the breeds that are part of that group, basically are indistinguishable from wolves in their genetics. And so they tend to be very wolf-like. They tend to be more aggressive. They tend to be better, very, very powerful hunters. They tend to have a much stronger dominance hierarchy and therefore dominance issues. So when we see dominance issues, which are very rare as behavior issues in dogs, but when we do see dominance issues, either between uh, two dogs or between a dog and an owner, it tends to be in one of those ancient breeds. Understanding uh, need um, to exert dominance and social structure over limited resources is only found in a, in a few breeds of dogs. Many breeds of dogs, that behavior has been bred out of them completely. Dominance tends to be, social structure tends to be not very important to any of the terriers, which is where the pit bulls and, and a lot of the bully breeds are. Uh, another group, another uh, very clearly defined genetic group are the mastiffs, um, where some of those breeds are located. And again, uh, it's, it's very rare or virtually unknown to have dominance behavior issues with those, those groups. It's pretty much reserved to the, these ancient breeds and a couple of other breeds. Hovering over him, interfering, alpha rolling, uh, rolling them over on their back and so on is never a good idea. They're not expressing dominance towards the human, they're expressing dominance towards another dog most often. Any kind of an act, action taken by the human is gonna be completely misinterpreted by the dog. It's gonna be interpreted as an attack. Hey, I'm over here uh, dealing with this other dog and some limited resource of some kind, and all of a sudden you attack me. And so that's never a good thing for the relationship between humans and dogs. the hovering over, the alpha rolling, are not dominant signals. They're not part of dominance aggression. Wolves don't do them. Wild dogs do not do them. So again, it's the wrong individual expressing dominance, trying to control the situation, and then that wrong individual is doing it the wrong way. Uh, and so it's even more likely to be simply interpreted as an attack by a human and that results in all sorts of other issues and problems and relationship issues and, and so on. So it's, it's most definitely not a, not a good idea. Probably 80% of the cases of aggression that I see in dogs has to do with anxiety. Anxiety is the major aggression problem uh, in dogs and, and the one that we have to work on. At Smith's most. Food and Drug in Murray, a popular place these days is the manager's office where they have the surveillance video. You had to see to believe it, but it happened, so <laughs> it's crazy. A suspicious character entered through the front door. No, I've never seen him shopping before. Brand new customer, didn't even have his fresh value card. What happened next is already becoming legend. How likely is that for a dog to walk into a store, go down a pet aisle, get his bone and walk out? Let's reconstruct the crime a step at a time. Entering at the checkout area, he approached a young girl. He just kind of snipped the customer up and then he headed down the aisle. At that point, he had a decision to make. Left, no dog food. Right, dog food. 
He turned right and went straight to aisle 16. The dog food aisle. He knew, he, knew, he knew where he was headed. There are so many fun Christmas presents he could have picked. I mean, look at this. This one even lights up. But he seemed to know exactly what he was after. He grabbed a rawhide bone like this and headed down the aisle, only to be confronted by the manager. I looked at him. I said, drop it. I decided I wanted to keep all my fingers, so I didn't, uh, I didn't try to take it from him. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he ran for the door, and away he went. <laughs> right out the front door. Look at that dog go. Expert Marshall Tanner says the culprit's sense of smell is 100,000 times better than the typical crook. Smell the rawhide bone, grabbed it, and walked out of the store, thereby being a shoplifting dog. At last word, he was still at large, presumably enjoying his Christmas Eve. Where is it? Where is it? It's not here. Where is it, Wicked? 